Hey everybody, Four Gun Guy here. Welcome to another video in my three gun series. This one's gonna be focused on my favorite three gun, my rifle. Now I built this rifle about six years ago. I've made some updates to it since then. I'll include those in, uh, in our discussion today. But what I thought we would do is, whether you're gonna build or buy one off the shelf, let's look at the components that make up a good three gun rifle. And we'll look at what to consider in each one of those components. Then we'll look at the build cost for this rifle. So if you were gonna build this exact rifle today, what would it cost you? And, and let's look at some options to reduce that cost. We'll also look at some off the shelf options because there's a lot of rifles out there that are pretty much off the shelf that'll just go right into three gun. So we'll look at my famous comparison matrix that you've probably seen in a lot of my other videos and then my selection criteria as well. After that, we'll do final thoughts. So if you're ready to go, let's get to it. Well, I'd like to break things down into the major components of the rifle, uh, starting with, in my opinion, the order of importance, which would be the upper lower combination, the barrel, the trigger, the bolt carrier group or BCG, the muzzle brake, charging handle, buttstock, handguard, safety, and grip. Let's go ahead and break this rifle down into the components that you just saw in the list. And then we'll talk about each one of them, uh, a cost range, and then uh, what you want to look for in that component. Let's start with the upper lower combination. Uh, I went ahead and broke the uh, rifle down. And what we have here is the lower, which is this piece right here. It's everything right there. And the lower basically houses the magazine. This is the, uh, the, the mag well. It has the grip and it has the trigger group. That's really the main purpose of the lower. It's attached to the buttstock, and we're going to get into the buttstock in a little bit. The upper is from this part on back, minus, of course, the scope and the scope mount. And this uh, attaches to the handguard, which you see here, diamond head, and the barrel, which is inside the handguard there. And then what goes in the upper is the charging handle and the bolt carrier group, which we're gonna to get to in a little bit as well. And when you put both those in there, you've got this complete upper. Let's talk about some of the manufacturers you might run into with uh, uppers and lowers. They include Spikes Tactical, Aero Precision, Palmetto State Armory, Seekins, F1, JP Enterprises, Daniel Defense, and probably about a hundred more. So there's a lot of companies out there that are manufacturing uh, uppers and lowers. Mine is a Spikes Tactical. So this is a Spikes. I really like it. It's been great. I've had it for what, six years? Never had a failure. Everything works just fine in it. When you're looking at upper lower combinations, make sure you get a combination, right? So I got Spikes and when I fit this together, there's no gap here. It's a very clean tight fit and that's really what you're looking for read the reviews make sure that that people are saying that the fit is tight there are three types of manufacturing processes basically for these things the first type is cast which is the cheapest and weakest doesn't mean it's bad it just means it's the weakest of the three and that's basically you pour molten aluminum into a mold and then they clean it off with machinery the second is billet which is actually the most expensive, but you can get more designs, better designs out of it. Uh, like you can get skeletonized. Generally, if you see skeletonized uppers and lowers, uh, they'll be billets. Um, and that's really made by cutting it out from a single piece of aluminum bar stock. And then the third is forged, which is mid price. And it's actually the strongest because it's made by really hammering that raw aluminum into uh, the various shapes for the upper and the lower. So all I want to say here is 
Don't mix your uppers and lowers. Get a matched set and go with a good manufacturer. I think spikes, the, these things even today, are 230 bucks for both the upper and the lower combination. Now let's talk about the barrel. Barrels will run you anywhere from $100 to $600. Manufacturers include Rainier, Faxon, Nemo, Noveski, Ballistic Advantage, Proof Research, and Daniel Defense, and again, a hundred more. Uh, these are just a representation. Mine is a Rainier Arms uh, barrel, and the barrel is actually, you know, down inside the handguard here. Uh, this barrel is chambered for 5.56 which means I can fire either a 5.56 round, which has more pressure than a 2.23 round, or a 2.23 round. Um, I would recommend you go with a 5.56 barrel, and there are other chambers out there, right? There's like 2.23 wild and all that stuff. Stick with 5.56, that way you can shoot the 5.56 or the 2.23, and you'll be fine. Lengthwise, this is a 16 inch barrel. I would suggest stick with a 16, anywhere from 14 to 18 inch barrel, uh, just for maneuverability. Twist rate, this is a one and eight twist, which means um, that uh, it rotates one time every eight inches of the barrel. So by the time the bullet has left this barrel, it's rotated twice. You want about a one and eight twist rate if you're gonna shoot, you know, normal 223 ammunition, like 55 grain uh, bullets. From a rifling standpoint, you have different options here. You have cold hammer forged, button rifling, broach cut, electrolysis, which is a new technique. Um, I tend to like cold hammer forged because it actually works the steel more um, and makes the, the barrel a little stronger. My opinion and from what I've researched, a button rifling, they just basically pull a button through the, through the barrel and it cuts out the grooves. Um, Broach cut is where they, it's, it's like the button, but it's got a, a line with larger and larger buttons as it goes th through. So it's not stressing like a button uh, rifling might do. It starts with a small button and it, it, it get, they get larger and larger as they pull it through. Uh, just less stress on the barrel. Steel type, 4140 chrome molly is what this is or you can go with the 416 stainless steel. And then uh, another thing that people talk about is lined or unlined, right? So you have a chrome line barrel, melanite line barrel, or no lining. Um, I have a chrome lined here. Uh, people will say, well, chrome, the thing about a chrome lined barrel is the chrome isn't necessarily dispersed evenly along the inside of the barrel and in the chamber. And that could affect your accuracy. Hey, for three gun, I only need this thing to reach out at most 400 yards. And generally speaking in a three gun competition here locally, we're not going beyond 150 yards. It's been fine with me. I have MOA groups at hundred yards, which means within hundred yards, it's one inch grouping. That's perfect for me. Uh, and then finally the barrel profile, you have things like lightweight or pencil M4 medium, which is what this one is. A bull barrel, which is really thick all the way down the length of the barrel. And then on top of those, you could flute the barrels where they cut off some of the, some of the metal on the outside of the barrel. There's all sorts of conversations about which barrel type to get. And fluting. Fluting has a whole nother uh, conversation of its own, which we're not going to get into. I would say stick with your M4 medium. You'll be fine. 14 to 18 inches, a one and eight barrel twist. You should be just fine with the barrel. Let's move on to the trigger. Uh, the trigger is one of the, one of the biggest things you're going to want to look at in your rifle. Uh, this trigger is a Geisley super dynamic three gun trigger manufacturers include Geisley, Rise Armament, Elfman, POF USA, JP Enterprises, Rock River, Spikes Tactical, Timney, CMC, and Bravo Company, and again, a hundred others, right? So they're all over the place from a trigger standpoint. Uh, what you're looking for here is a good, crisp trigger with a short take-up 
crisp break, and a short reset. That's a lot to talk about, but let's just look and see what I mean by this. I'm going to try to hold it up here so I don't ruin my trigger. Um, what, I, what I want you to do is watch my finger come back on this trigger and see how far back it actually takes to, to uh, pull the trigger. Okay, that was about a sixteenth of an inch. Now I'm going to do this again, but but then, uh, so the take up is that distance that I have to pull back to engage the trigger. So let's watch that again. Right there, it was about a sixteenth of an inch. Now when I engage the trigger, and um, so let me do that again. I have the trigger pulled back. In a real live firing situation, it would recoil, it would reset that hammer, and you can see that I'm still holding back on the trigger. The reset then is the distance that I'm going to let up on my finger to where the trigger is going to reset. So when I pull it again, it actually drops the hammer. So let's watch this. I'm going to let up. There's the reset, about a sixteenth of an inch or maybe an eighth, but not much. And then now I just fired it again. Okay, so that was very slow. What I'm saying is when you're double tapping, you're literally going boom, 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 boom. Okay, and this is what you want. You don't want a trigger that's going to come way out here and you're going to have to pull way back here and it's hard, it's difficult. This is set, I think this is a three pound uh, trigger on this thing. Other thing is you want a single stage trigger for your three gun rifle. You can put a two stage trigger in other rifles, maybe a hunting rifle. If you're gonna use, uh, if you're gonna use it for hunting as well, you may want a two stage trigger, but if you're gonna use it just for three gun, single stage. I wanted to pause now and talk about the gas system that you're going to decide on. So there are basically two types of gas system. There's a gas piston or a direct impingement, what they call direct impingement. My rifle is a direct impingement gas system. Here's what this means. If you look up here on the barrel, you'll see a little block here. That's actually called the gas block. There's a hole in the barrel. There's a hole in the gas block. There's a tube that you can probably see in here running from the gas block back to the into the upper receiver. And what happens here is that if you can see that tube down there, when I put in my charging handle and I put in my bolt carrier group that we're going to get to in a, in a little bit, Watch that tube go through the charging handle there. See, it goes through that charging handle. And what it's going to engage in, I'll show you in a minute, is the, the gas key on this bolt carrier group. And the gas key is this thing right here, this thing at the top. That tube in here goes in this tube here. Okay. And what happens is when you fire this this gun, the bullet travels down the barrel. When it gets to this gas uh, uh, block here, the gases, some of the gases, force themselves up into the gas block, back into the gas tube. They engage that bolt carrier group, which is trying to go backwards actually from the recoil of the shot, but it can't because it's locked. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit too. You can see that kind of camming there. It's locked. The gas comes in here, unlocks it. The force blows it back. It ejects the round. And then the spring in your buffer tube right here, there's a spring in here with the buffer, a metal buffer that goes back. It slams the bolt carrier group back forward, which picks up another round and chambers it and locks. All that happens every time you fire a round. So, uh, the other type of gas system is what they call a piston driven gas system. In that system, when the gases come up in here into the gas block, they actually 
drive a piston. They don't go all the way back here uh, to the back of the upper receiver. They actually drive a piston back, which then kind of operates the same way, right? It's helping to unlock the, the bolt carrier group so it can go back. Uh, direct impingement, what I have, is dirtier than a piston system. Piston system's easier to clean because you don't have the gases coming back in here into this area, into the bolt carrier uh, group. So it's, it's a little easier to clean. Also, with a piston system, uh, you'll see some adjustable piston systems. So if I'm running a low quality ammo or if my gun is really, really dirty and it just doesn't want to cycle, I can kind of adjust this gas system to let more gas come up and, and affect that piston. You don't really do that in a direct impingement. I don't run cheap ammunition, so I've never had to worry about it. I've never had a jam in this rifle. And I've run a steel case, um, uh, wolf uh, ammo. Um, so I've run all types of ammo in this thing. I've never had a problem. This is a direct impingement. Uh, I'm not going to tell you which one to get. Talk to some other people about what they have on their rifles, but I've been very, very happy uh, with this so far. When we talked about the uh, gas system, I mentioned the bolt carrier group. So let's talk about this. These will run you anywhere from 130 up to $400. Uh, dollars. I know it's filthy. I apologize. As I said, I shot uh, this past weekend. I just didn't <laughs> have a chance to clean it. Uh, manufacturers here, there's hundreds of them as well. Some of the better ones are Fail Zero, Aero Precision, Ares Armament, Bravo Company, Spikes Tactical, Radical Firearms. And again, there's a bunch more. Um, mine, this is an Ares Reduced Friction Nickel Boron Plated Bolt Carrier Group. Get a decent brand, okay? And the one thing you really want to look out for on these, let me see if I can get this kind of closer here, is I'm hoping this comes into focus. I'm going to try to focus it right there. I want you to see right here, you can, you can kind of see where it looks like there's, there's indentations, okay? You want to get a gas key that has been, quote, properly staked. That's what this means. It means that they've indented both sides of this gas key. Remember I told you this part here is the gas key. They've indented both sides on this gas key. So these two bolts or nuts, or they're not nuts, they're actually bolts, won't back out on you. So just make sure that you get a properly staked gas key. That's pretty important. Uh, there are different coatings for these things. I mean, a lot of different coatings. There's nickel boron, black nitride, phosphate, titanium nitride, diamond light carbon, and a new one called Robar MP3. I'm a fan of nickel boron because of its high resistance to wear and corrosion, and it has an ultra low coefficient of friction. It's also easy to clean. I mean, this is dirty now, but when I clean this up, it looks, it looks pretty good. From a brand perspective, just make sure you get a decent brand. We already talked about the staking. And also one last thing, when you're ordering a BCG, make sure you're ordering a bolt carrier group. This is a bolt carrier group. Why? Because it has the bolt carrier, which is this whole large assembly here. It has the gas key, which they'll mostly have anyway, but it also has the bolt. <laughs> this is the bolt right here. You may go online and see a bolt carrier, $89.99. You go, wow, that's a great deal. You're just buying the bolt carrier. You're not buying the bolt. Uh, you're, you're most likely getting the gas key as well. But I'm just saying, and, and by the way, inside of all this, you probably can't see it here, but the, the uh, firing pin is like right here. So it, it's, the, it's basically the length of this part right here. So just be careful what you're ordering. Order good quality. This is one of those components that you don't want to skimp on. Uh, so whatever coating you end up going with, I like the nickel boron, but you can, you can choose something of your own as well. This next one is really funny to me. 
we're going to talk about the muzzle brake. <laughs> now, <laughs> muzzle brakes, you're going to be able, you're going to spend $30 up to $200, sometimes up to $300 for this little piece of steel right here. It's called the muzzle brake. Manufacturers include Strike Industries, Lantac, Precision, Precision Armament, KAK, Surefire, Seekins, and Bravo Company, along with, again, you bet, a hundred others. Uh, mine, this muzzle brake, which is a fantastic muzzle brake, I get comments on it all the time, was an Amazon muzzle, muzzle brake when Amazon sold uh, gun parts for $20. I paid $20 for this muzzle brake. This thing, there's no rise. There's no anything. This is just a fantastic brake. What do I mean by that? Here's what you want out of your muzzle brake. You're in the match. You're shooting. You want this. You want the gun to always just stay level and come back into your shoulder. That's what you want. You don't want your gun to do this because now it's flipping. This is what you call muzzle flip. And when it flips up, what did I just do? I just lost sight of my target in my scope or my red dot or on my iron sights because the muzzle flipped up. I don't want that. I want a nice, even back into my shoulder shot. You achieve that with a muzzle brake. The, the side vents are venting the gases, the majority of the gases out of the side. These two holes in the top are venting gas up, which is keeping the muzzle down. Think about that. Okay. Do your research. There's a really good older review of muzzle brakes, and I'll put that in the video here, uh, a link to it. This guy does like three different muzzle brake comparisons of like 40 muzzle brakes in each one. And it's, it's amazing to see how the cheaper muzzle brakes can sometimes keep right up with those $200 uh, muzzle brakes. So that's why I say this is a funny one because I only paid $20 for it and it's been a fantastic muzzle brake. Let's talk about this little guy. This is called the charging handle. And this is a very important piece of equipment as well. Uh, you'll see on this one, this was from, is from Strike Industries. It's forged 7075. T6 aluminum, so very good aluminum. And from a charging handle perspective, you can uh, expect to pay anywhere from $20 up to $150 for a charging handle. And what does it do? It allows you to charge your weapon. Charge your weapon. I just charged this thing. So if I had the lower attached to it with a magazine and ammunition, there would be a round in the chamber. Okay, how do I charge it? With the charging handle. So if I want to, I pull this back and you can see what's happening. I, I left the, the lower off on purpose because you can see what's happening, right? I'm bringing this back and it's pulling the bolt carrier group back with it. Then what would happen when I let this go? It would slam home with a round into the chamber. So let's put this together real quick. Come on, baby. There we go. And then let's see how this is going to work. Let me do it kind of this way so you can see. So I'm going to charge it. All I just did was you saw what I did just a second ago without this on. Now what's happening is as I'm pulling this back, it's got a latch on it, so it will release. If I do it from the other side, it won't release. This is why you're probably going to want an ambidextrous charging handle, a charging handle with a release on both sides. I just didn't go with one. I, I really just don't need it. When I pull this back, that bolt carrier group in there is being pulled back into the buttstock. It's compressing the, uh, the uh, spring back here. It's compressing uh, everything else that's in here. And there we go. And then I have an open chamber. And when I let go, it comes down. Okay. So that's really the, uh, the purpose of the charging handle. You might want to get a little wider charging handle than I have here 
because of exactly what I just did here. I've got my scope on there. It's kind of in the way, but when I'm at, the, at a match charging this up, it's, it's really not in the way at all. So I'm fine with it like that. Uh, the only other thing I would say is uh, you might want to get um, this bolt release catch. I'll put this in the, uh, in the video as well. What this does is it allows you to, to manipulate and leave the bolt open with your trigger finger here. See, I used my trigger finger. Now that's up. I didn't have to screw with this over here because otherwise I would have had to, with this hand, uh, flip this up to hold the bolt open. This way I don't have to do it. And when I flip this, the bolt just closes, okay? So that's the charging handle. Let's move on. We're at the butt stock. Uh, butt stocks are going to run you anywhere from $40 to 250 plus. Uh, manufacturers here include Magpul, Hogue, Bravo Company, Leapers, Daniel Defense, Sequins, Luth AR, Radical Firearms, uh, and, and again, about 100 others. This is a Luth AR butt stock. I like it a lot. Uh, I don't think I'd spend the money on another one, uh, though it, it's good but I'm not sure that it's worth the $190 that I paid for it. Um, but again, it's been a good buttstock. Some things you're going to look at here is this buttstock has the buffer assembly built into it. So remember we talked earlier about the buffer tube, the buffer spring, the buffer itself. And when I charge this, remember what I said, as I'm charging this back, it's bringing the bolt back in here. It's compressing the buffer spring. It's compressing the buffer, which is about right here probably when I bring it back. And it's doing all that in a built-in buffer tube for this buttstock. So just research your buttstock, see what you might want, uh, what's gonna work for you. I would start simple if you're building your own because there's a lot of different buttstocks out there. There's A1, A2, mil-spec carbine, uh, commercial carbine. And the only other thing I would say is make sure that you are pairing the right uh, buffer tube and buffer tube assembly with the spring and the buffer with your gas system. All of this works in concert. If you have an undergassed gas system, it won't throw this bolt back, the bolt carrier group, back far enough uh, if you have the right gas system, but the wrong buffer tube and buffer and buffer spring in here, it still may not throw the bolt uh, carrier group back far enough. So just make sure that you're matching the right back with the right front. The handguard. Uh, now this is a diamond head handguard. I started with a cheaper handguard one that costs, I think, 50 or $60, again, probably off of Amazon, I think, back in the day. Uh, and it worked really well. It was just a little big for me. So I looked at Diamond Head. I love the look of these. And beyond the looks, folks, these are very ergonomic. Look, look at how I can wrap all the way around that. And I hold my rifle all the way at the end. In fact, I wear a glove on this hand uh, so I don't get burned by the gases. That's how far out I hold this rifle. I'm, I'm out to here when I'm shooting. I'm not back here. Uh, if you're more comfortable back here, then you could get a shorter handguard and probably save you some money. Uh, the handguard here on these types of rifles is what's called free floating, which means the only place it touches anything is where I have screwed it on to the barrel nut. Okay. It's screwed on there. It, nothing else out here is touching the barrel. No other piece of this handguard is touching the barrel. So it's called a free float. Why do you want to do that? So you don't affect the harmonics of the barrel. So you don't interfere with the barrel when you're uh, putting this up on a barr barricade. When you're really stressing and moving it around, you're not affecting the barrel whatsoever. Let's see, you've got, from a manufacturer standpoint, this is going to run you anywhere from 50 to 350 dollars. You've got Diamond Head, Bravo Company, Aero Precision, 
Radical Firearms, Ghost Firearms, Spikes Tactical, Yankee Hill, and anyone else out there with a CNC machine and some aluminum tubing is going to be making a, uh, a handguard. So again, this one is the Diamond Head VRS. Uh, it's a uh, Series 2 M-Lock. And just make sure of a couple things also on a handguard. Make sure of good rail placement. Make sure you can attach rails here. Now, I will say Diamond Head is the only thing I don't like about it is it's proprietary rails. So I have to buy their rails to attach to this thing, which I didn't really like, but I, I went ahead and did it anyway. Uh, you want an ergonomic handguard. You want something that, as I said before, is going to really feel good and feel that you've got control of it. The other thing I want to talk about here is if you look right here, you can see where the handguard rail is coming down and it meets the built-in rail of the upper receiver. Make sure that that's the case because what you don't want to have happen is this upper receiver rail be higher or lower than this rail. Then when you're starting to mount things like iron sights, uh, you may have some issues there, right? Because they're not on the same plane. Uh, so you may have to buy something to raise one up or lower one or whatever. So just good ergonomics. I would start inexpensive with the handrail and uh, and just work your way up. It's one of those things that over time you can just, like I did, buy a better one and upgrade. Let's look at some of the rest of the parts on this thing. Uh, one, one is the grip. Now this grip uh, came with my lower parts kit. You'll see the term lower parts kit. Generally, they'll come with a crappy trigger and a, 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 a real plastic grip like this is. But I got to tell you, I love this grip. This thing feels great. <laughs> so I don't need to buy some $100 fancy schmancy grip. This thing has worked really good. Safety, it'll come with a safety. I'm just a single safety guy with my thumb. Other people want an ambidextrous safety. So if you look over here, when I flip it, you'll see this turn. They want a safety over here that they could manipulate with their trigger finger. I got to be honest with you. My thinking is there are three things now that I'm manipulating with my trigger finger. It's the magazine release. It's my bolt catch that I put on there. And it's the trigger. I don't want anything else to think about on this side of the gun. Uh, I just want to have this as the only thing I have to think about on the left side of the gun. So that's a safety. You'll get those lower parts. There'll be springs. There'll be de detents. There'll be all sorts of, uh, of things in there that are going to help you uh, add everything to this lower receiver. The other thing that I did was I did get an oversized trigger guard because if it's winter time and you're wearing gloves, uh, some of those trigger guards come right up to below this trigger and some trigger guards uh, this trigger won't fit with. But uh, that gives you a little added room in this uh, trigger area. What else? Uh, the iron sights, again, I think I paid 50 bucks for these things. We'll go over all this in the, in the detailed uh, build uh, list. But I think I paid 50 bucks for these things. And these things have worked great. I got them off of Amazon. They've been fine. I only use these when I'm within 15 yards of a target anyway out there. You'll turn your, your gun 45 degrees. And now you're down on your iron sights and you're going away. Get back out to 20 and 20 yards and out. I'm back on the scope and we're, and we're good to go. So, wow, I think we've covered everything. Um, you know what? I do want to talk about one more thing. I am not going to include the optic in this uh, discussion because that's something that's very personal to what you want to do and, and how you want to shoot. I will tell you, make sure you get a good mount for whatever optic you're going to run, right? Um, I would caution you about getting a quick release mount for your optic. Uh, if it's a red dot and you're very comfortable that it's going to stay zeroed, okay, maybe. But if it's a scope like this, please don't get a, um, a quick detach. Just put the thing on the gun and leave it alone. That way you're always assured that you're zeroed. Okay, let's take a pause here now and look at the cost of building my, this rifle from scratch. And, and we'll also look at things like, you know, my cheapy, my cheapy uh, bipod that I got for, I think, $26 on Amazon. And this thing's been just, just fine for what I do with three gun. 
So let's pause and take a look at the build. Let's look at the cost of my build. Now uh, I'm going to break it down in the components that we mentioned before. So from a barrel perspective, it was the Rainier Arms M29, M249 chrome line. That was $300. Trigger, Geisley Super Dynamic 3-Gun at $240. Lower and upper combo, I got a combo, like I mentioned in my uh, about what to look for from Spikes Tactical, $230. The bolt carrier group was an Ares Reduced Friction Nickel Boron, which I really like the Nickel Boron BCGs. Hand guard is the diamond head. Now, I didn't start with this hand guard. Uh, I think I put a little cheapo $50 hand guard on there, and it worked for a while. It was really good, but I really like the ergonomic uh, ergonomics of the diamond head hand guards. They're not cheap, but they really do feel good in the hand. Stock assembly is the Luth AR. Uh, and I, I'm not sure I would go with this on another build. I'd probably look for something different. It's just that I just don't think the value is there for the money that you're spending. Lower parts kit with the grip, so I got that from Spikes Tactical. The charging handle is just a Strike Industries charging handle. It does have the extended latch, but I'm probably going to upgrade that in the near future to a ambidextrous uh, charging handle. Uh, bolt catch release lever, now we get into the smaller stuff, right? So all in on this rifle, when you look at the final build of this thing, it's about $1,483. Uh, I put together some other alternative prices <clears throat> just by doing some reviews on stuff. I didn't want to put the actual manufacturers or the product in here because I, I'm, I'm trying not to, uh, I'm trying to stay kind of agnostic for you. But what I wanted to say here is you could build your own for a lot cheaper than what I did, right? Just be careful when you start getting lower and lower in the cost of things. You may be giving up some quality there and quality that's going to bite you in the form of functionality. Is this thing going to break down in the middle of a match? Is it going to jam? Uh, am I going to have to replace that same part after 1500 rounds, let's say, because it's just not good quality and it's breaking down. So when you start looking at that, uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, on some of these things you want to go with good quality and others that you're, you're open to replacing in the, in the future. So let's go ahead and look at some other accessories here, more importantly, the optics uh, and the tools that you might need to build your own rifle. Well, when we're looking at the accessories here, you want to look at something like the optic mount right now. I'm just using mine as an example. So I have the worn one piece Gen 2 extended. Uh, again, that's $140, but it's a darn good optic mount. I did not include my optics. So I did not include the uh, loophole VX6. That's just something you're going to have to research and decide what you want to do. Do you want to go with a red dot? Do you want to go with a red dot with a magnifier on it? Uh, or do you want to go... Uh, with something more like I went with, which is more of a tactical scope, something you're going to have to consider. Bipod, again, I went cheap on the bipod here. Uh, I, you, I run an Atlas bipod on both my long range rifles, but for a three gun here, I just decided something cheap because as I said earlier, I hardly ever use a bipod in a match, rarely. And then you think about things like magazines, right? Well, you're going to want two 30 rounders and two probably 40 rounders. Uh, so that adds up, you know, as well. From a build tools perspective, look, I just put miscellaneous tools of 50 bucks in there because there's always little stuff that, that you're gonna need that, that I'm not gonna list out here. But for sure, you're gonna need a punch hammer, you're gonna need a punch kit, you're gonna need an AR tool and an AR clamp. So the AR tool is really to attach your barrel to the rifle, uh, and the clamp is to clamp your, your upper and lower, or your upper anyway, into, the, uh, into a vise so you can add your barrel to it. So these are some other things you're gonna to wanna to think about. So if you add these up, now you're into it for another 380 bucks roughly uh, for optics, the, you know, the mounts, the accessories, the magazines, and the build tools.
Well, next I wanted to look at some off the shelf options. Now, I'm going to tell you this is not an exhaustive list, right? There are so many off the shelf uh, rifles out there today that you're going to have to spend probably a week just researching what might be right for you. What I did do though is I wanted to throw in about nine or 10 off the shelf options, put them alongside my build so you could kind of see you know, what you get with off the shelf as opposed to if you did what I did and kind of just built it yourself. Now remember this, I built my rifle about six years ago. I've added to it ever since. And the off-the-shelf rifles today in 2020 are using really good materials, really good products. And I think you can get pretty darn close, even better than what I have built, just off the shelf. So I'm going to let you pause this at your leisure. The first uh, four I wanted to bring up were the Smith & Wesson MMP, the Springfield Saint Edge, the Smith & Wesson MMP Performance, and the Bravo Company uh, Reese, I think that's pronounced. But if you look at some of these, you know, here are some things to look at. And that's why I like to show you this. If you look at my other gun reviews, you'll see this is what I do. I put together a matrix, I fill it out, and then I analyze what extra will I have to buy for this gun? What comes with this gun that's really nice? For example, if you look at the Smith & Wesson, the first one, right, it comes with folding and bus sights. Uh, the bad thing is it's got a permanent uh, vortex flash hider that is not, you, you can't take that off the barrel. So that's what you're stuck with. The Springfield Saint, right? Flip up dual aperture rear sight, uh, uh, direct impingement low profile adjustable gas block. This one has an adjustable gas block. It's got a uh, single action multi-port muzzle brake or SA, I'm sorry and an ambidextrous safety. Some really good uh, things come with this with this rifle. And uh, looks like it's got a good uh, weight to it, match grade, short reset uh, trigger, and it's 1100 bucks. I mean, you know, Smith & Wesson, the performance, two-stage match trigger, which I told you, I, I think I told you, I traded my two-stage trigger for a single stage. That might not be what you want. It does not come with any, uh, um, iron sights so you'd have to buy the iron sights uh the bravo company no iron sights you'd have to buy the iron sights um so you know it does come with a chrome lined steel barrel uh, the bravo company does so it's things like that that you want to do your research on let's look at the next set now in this one we've got the fn 15 tactical carbine the armalite spikes tactical black the Rock River Arms and the Stag Arms. So again, just do your comparisons. You know, what I'm looking at here is that uh, the FN has chrome lined cold hammer forged barrel, good barrel. Uh, it does have the uh, iron sights. It's got a multi position collapsible Magpul uh, buttstock, ambidextrous safety. And look at that Spikes Tactical. I mean, you know, nickel boron BCG. Uh, six position Magpul uh, buttstock. Uh, now it's got a 14 and a half inch mid length uh, barrel, but it's chrome lined. Uh, it's amb ambidextrous. It's got QD attachment points. Um, and then look at the Rock River. Same thing. It's got an 18 inch fluted stainless steel barrel. Stainless steel barrel is very nice. Uh, the stag arms, there wasn't a lot of information on this thing, but it's got the diamond head flip up sights, the diamond head rail, uh, chrome lined barrel. I mean, it seemed like a nice, nice rifle. So look at all of the things you're getting in this price range. It's really, really nice. Now, I did not go under $1,000 because I wanted to kind of stay in the range between $1,000 and 1500 to compare it against my build. So again, please folks, I am not telling you to build your own AR. What I wanted to do here was just say, that's what I did. I'm really happy with it. And if I was doing it again today, I may look at one of these others and save the price of, of maybe some tools, but you're gonna have to get those tools anyway when you go to change your barrel out on one of these guns, right? When you're gonna do any work on any of these guns, you're still gonna need that 
uh, punch set. You're still going to need that hammer and the vise, uh, everything. So uh, I just wanted to give you some comparisons and hopefully let you see how you might want to start to do your comparisons when you look for your next rifle. Let's recap our video here. So I started by uh, telling you about all the components of the rifle uh, that I built, uh, what to look for in each of those components if you're going to look either to build or to buy off the shelf, right? Use that research for both those purposes. Uh, and then we went over the cost of that build and then we looked at some off the shelf, shelf options uh, for rifles in the $1,000 to $1,500 range. Now, this thing was about $1,500. I really feel that I have a great rifle here. I love this rifle. Um, I don't see where there's anything wrong with, with the build or what I've done. It runs like a champ. It never fails me. If you have, my advice to you would be though, if you're starting three gun and you have a rifle already, it's in your safe, uh, use it. Shoot it for the first six matches. Don't run out and buy a new rifle. Please don't do that. Shoot the rifle you have, get a couple 40 round magazines, shoot some matches, get used to the matches, the procedures, how to stage a match or a, a, a stage a stage. And then you can start looking at your equipment, right? Is, an, is another rifle going to help me, right? And do I want to go to that next level? Or am I just here to have fun? And man, I'm having a blast with the Smith, Smith & Wesson M&P, and I'm just having a ball, and I don't really need some uh, $1,500, $2,000, $3,000 rifle, or I'm looking at rifles in the $1,000 range, and that's where I want to stay. Set your budget and stick with it. Hopefully, my spreadsheet that I showed you will help you do that. Go down the left side. This is These are the important things you want to look for. Do your comparisons across the top, stick with your budget, and you should be fine. The other thing about using your own rifle when you go to a match is you should be able to ask someone to shoot their rifle after a stage. They'll let you do it. If you walked up to me after a stage and said, hey, four gun guy, could I shoot your rifle, send a couple round, few rounds through it? You betcha, no problem. Let's check with the RSO and the match director, see if it's okay. We don't have people waiting on us. Let's run into the bay and let's shoot it. That's a great way to see how other guns operate. That's a really great way to see how a trigger operates, how a really good trigger operates. You may not have a great trigger on yours, but you shoot some guns that do have some good triggers on them, you'll notice the difference. And now you're starting to see where you wanna spend your money, right? Either upgrading what you have, or when you go to that next level or to, the, or to that next gun. I hope this was helpful. I really do appreciate you hanging in there with me. I know it was another long one. Uh, I appreciate your likes, your comments, and your subscriptions. And there's a couple other videos I'm going to do on the three gun piece. Uh, one is going to be about just three gun itself, all the accessories. So far, we've talked about the guns, but we haven't talked about everything else that goes with these guns. So we'll talk about that. And then I really want to do a video on uh, three gun procedures. So it's your first match. What do you do when you get there? How do you set up for a stage? Those types of things. I would implore you to go to a match and don't shoot it. Go to one or even two matches and just watch. You don't have to stay the whole match. Pick a squad and follow them for about two or three stages. And you'll see how the procedure, what the procedure is. I've got some videos that you'll kind of be able to see how I think about stages and you'll see the process of, you know, when that buzzer goes off, what's going on uh, and, and actually in my mind. So with all that said, thanks again. And until next time, shoot straight.